Welcome to the Grace Force, everyone. This is the Grace Force podcast, and I'm here with my good bud, Doug and Beverly Stevens. I'm so excited to have Beverly with us. Uh, I'll tell you a little about, about Beverly in a second. Uh, we'll start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, yeah, we're so excited to have Beverly here. You know, everybody is um, is talking about the coronavirus. And Beverly, uh, I've just been amazed what you've been putting up on the internet and the knowledge that you have about this. So we asked you to come on and you were so kind to do that. Um, first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about Beverly. Beverly is the editor of Regina Magazine. It's an awesome, awesome magazine. Go, go look it up. Uh, she's a native New Yorker with a 25-year career in banking and finance, plus seven years teaching finance on military bases in Europe. Uh, Regina Magazine has a global audience, and it's mainly of Catholics. So, you know, I've, I've known you for a few years now. Um, I was going to call you Regina. <laughs> Beverly. Uh, and uh, it just um, I'm blessed to to have a friendship with you, and we've uh, we've we've been together with you know with some projects and things like that, but uh, just uh, connected on the internet mostly. And um, and again, I've been so impressed. I I've, I find myself writing you a little uh, private message every, every about every day, saying thank you, you know, thank you for for giving us such uh, rich knowledge about what's going on with this and. Uh, so, you, you know, you have contacts uh, around the world. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and maybe help us uh, understand a little bit about where you think we are with the coronavirus? Yeah, I think our perspective has a lot to do with the contacts that we have on the ground um, all over the world. I think right. probably the only place we don't have contacts is like Russia. Um, and that's the only place that I, I can think of. So our when we hear news, we tend to check it out with the people that we know locally, which is something that not even the, actually the big networks, um, you'd be surprised how thin their staffs are overseas. So that's why we look at everything um, in that way. So when this started to happen um, in mid-January, we immediately checked out with our sources in Singapore what was happening in China. Um, and what we got from them alarmed us. Um, I think that there was a the initial flurry of, of um, reports about, um, you know, what is this? What is this COVID-19? You know, was it invented in a laboratory? Did it come from this so-called so seafood market in Wuhan? Wuhan, by the way, is a city of 10 million, which makes it bigger than New York. Um, wow. And... Um, you know, it, it was really a very um, disturbing set of, you know, pieces of information. But what was even more disturbing was that there wasn't any, didn't seem like there was any real, you know, information being transmitted. And then the Italian thing happened. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of, um, of people on the ground in Italy. So we were getting direct information about, um, you know, the Italian's, First, it was li limited to Lombardia, which is ar around Milan. Um, and, and here's what I mean when I say insight. So what most people don't realize is that Northern Italy is extremely industrial and that a lot of that, those, those businesses there are luxury businesses. Um, you know, the big brand names are there um, and they manufacture luxury goods there the people who work in their factories, and this is going back 25, 30 years, are mainly Chinese. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tremendous amount of traffic between Northern China, I mean, with, between Northern Italy and China and air traffic I'm talking about. Also the clientele for a lot of the luxury goods in, for example, the luxury district in the middle of uh, Florence is a tremendous amount of people from mainland China who are the customer base for these people. So that was the first thing I thought, oh, oh no. And then I just recently found out because I asked somebody on the ground there. So Trump stopped our flights on January 31st and he got a lot of heat for that. 
They didn't stop the flights into Italy until February 23rd. Wow. So it's three weeks of not an occasional flight into right. it, but a lot of flights. And they had a big holiday going on. So a lot of people are traveling there, right? Right. So there was, so it's Chinese New Year. There was, yeah. you know, there was all kinds of, tra- there's a lot of traffic going on. So that was the first thing that I saw that nobody was covering in the U.S. press. There was no, um, there was no, I mean, there was a little bit on the BBC, but very little in general. And that's sort of alarmed me. Um, and then I, then I found this, um, this, these series of videos by this very good UK doctor. His name is Campbell. He does a daily, very clear 15, 20 minute video on YouTube. And you can find him in which he started this six weeks ago in which he said, right, this is what's going on. And he, you know, he's got his paper with all his information and he takes mm-hmm. you through what he thinks he sees. And he explains in very clear language for the rest of us, how this, you know, what are the issues, how this stuff gets transmitted, what we know, what we don't know, you know, and, and all the real questions. And he's followed it through. I highly recommend people watch Dr. Okay. Campbell. Um, so, so there was that, and then, um, and then with the with um, you know watching the different um, places in the world, the first thing that Dr. Campbell kept talking about six weeks ago is we have to we have to stop it. We have to corral this virus. We have to we can't let it. It's highly contagious. Um, and then I started um, getting information from people that we knew on the ground about how basically any kind of warnings about that were being ignored uh, on massive scales. Um, And that alarmed me even more. So that made me start asking a lot more questions of a lot of people. So here we are. So I'm sorry, Beverly, um, I've been seeing some videos. I am familiar with Dr. Jonathan Campbell, by the way. I have seen some of his videos. He's got some really amazing stuff. He's very, he's very precise. He, like you said, he, he details things out. He's got his paper there. He's always listing things down. It's really, really good stuff. Um, a lot of people, as Father mentioned at the beginning, we've had some, some column naysayers who just, they, they don't want to accept that this is a problem. There's all the talk about whether it's a big New World Order effort, which would be pretty massively well-organized for so many countries to be involved Regardless, I'm not an expert. I don't know. I don't know that anybody really knows for sure. Anyway, there's a lot of a lot of um, kind of speculation or a lot of people out there who are just kind of extrapolating bits of information and, and creating these theories and opinions and all. But based on the facts that we have and the people you've talked to, Italy, Spain, France, UK, I mean, in general, Europe, uh, Bavaria shutting down, India's closing borders and so forth. Um, are they all looking kind of at what happened first in China and now in Italy? Are they looking at the, like the, the trajectory of all this and the projections based on numbers and time and so forth? Is that why they're really closing things down? Because they do see this could come to them, what is happening in Italy? I think the images coming out of Italy and now Spain, by the way, we've just put some images. There's, there's men lying in hospital corridors on the floor. There's like, there's, you know, there's just a line of like 20 patients, you know, going down the, um, going down the, the, the corridor. I think these images are basically spurring um, politicians to react. I mean, I, I believe that's the case. Um, as far as all this other stuff, you know, there's, um, I remember reading and I can't, I can't remember where, but years ago, Epidemiologists talking about that often these, um, you know, these kinds of diseases get spread by people who refuse to pay attention or to listen to one thing or another. There's been all kinds of cases where that was the case going back in the history of epidemics. Um, you know, I don't blame people. I, I, You know, I've been paying close attention through social media for seven years about what's been going on, mostly in the Catholic Church, um, for being skeptical. I mean, right? I mean, we see daily, you know, you know, we're being lied to by 
by um, what used to be trusted authorities. Mm -hmm. You know, not even to mention the obvious bias in our media and, and, and the really shoddy job that, that, that so much that we see so often in, in, um, in television media and in, in written media. I mean, it's really not great. So I, I don't blame people right. for being um, suspicious um, of something like this, particularly if, if it's something that's not been around ever before in anyone's lifetime. It makes perfect sense that this would be the case. Yeah. Um, but my point of view on the whole thing is, um, you know, I have, I would much rather err on the side of having been um, very, very careful to save lives rather than um, to, to go off into the wild blue yonder with a whole bunch of theories that I've strung together about one or another, you know, possibility that this might be. And, yeah, and you talk about, you talk about distrust too. And um, I, I know there's a lot of Catholics out there that um, just have seen things happen in the church over the last 50 years. And, and they, they've kind of lost their trust for, I think for our, our bishops, our leaders, not, you know, not a whole lot, but, but enough. And, uh, and, and so when the bishops all, you know, this past week uh, joined together and decided to um, distance us, distance the faithful from our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Yeah, uh, it didn't sit well with a lot of people. But uh, I've been I've been watching you and your excellent explanations and what you feel about that. Can you kind of give us your perspective on all that, Beverly? Well. Um, you know, I had somebody online tell me that basically challenged me, challenging me on my faith and how Catholic I was because yeah. they were being, we need to be careful about all of this. And, you know, my Italian came out and I said, look, <laughs> my family's been Catholic since the Roman Empire. Right. And I'm sorry, but you don't get to question my faith. That's right. So that made me start to think like, you know, what is it, you know, what's really going on here? You know, look, the bishops as a whole, not just in this country, I repeat, not just in this country, right. done a lousy job of gaining people's um, support, faith, trust. We've been lied to and we know it. Yeah. So these guys are not starting from a really good position yeah. overall. Right. So then, you know, the decisions that they made, honestly, I think they made the decisions, you know, out of a combination of self-preservation and legal advice. Um, and, you know, that's they made their decision. But, you know, I also happen to know, um, I'm very privileged to know um, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, and when I first met him in London six years ago, he and I had a three hour conversation. It's fascinating. He told me his whole story about his family growing up in, um, in Russia, the whole backstory of, of who he was and where he came from. Now Schneider, he's, okay, these people are, are Germans that were essentially thrown out of Germany in the 18th century. And they wound up in Russia and then they were around Odessa um, and the Black Sea, and then during World War II, because they were afraid that Hitler would come in with his his uh, Nazi army and combine with the Germans, they dragged those people out of their homes. But in all this time, can you imagine? They all still speak German. It's they still they hold their they held their faith and they held their Germanness. So even though Bishop Schneider is my age, and he grew up in a you know in in a in Kazakhstan, which I didn't even know where it was until I met the guy, um, he, you know, the family kept the faith under the most amazing circumstances. And he told me the story of his mother and his grandmother um, basically hiding priests, getting hold of the Blessed Sacrament once a year, and then, you know, being left with it so that they could 
give it to the, the, the sick and the homebound and all of this. This faith without contact with the, with the clergy really just um, impressed me. And, and I think of that now, and he just, he's just done a video, which we just put on Regina, um, in which he talks about this. He says, you know, oh, yeah, we don't have access to the sacrament for however long, days, weeks, months, but, you know, my faith is, is not, it, it isn't, doesn't come because I have contact with the sacrament. It's strengthened by my contract with the, the sacrament, but it doesn't spring from that. We have a lot of people who were, you know, I had one girl, you know, she was all upset. You know, they've closed, closed lords. Does that mean the healing waters don't heal? I'm like, you know, it, what is, is this the result that we're talking about after 50 years of non-catechesis that people don't understand how things work? Yeah. And another woman, tell me, no one has <clears throat> ever been sickened by contact with the host and the precious blood. I'm sorry. Accidents? Do we understand that concept? Right. Really no, because nobody's like, you know, I learned this stuff in second grade. So yeah, ca Catholics invented science, right? Right. There's that, the other thing, you know, we're not, you know, and, and, and then I heard from people in South Korea, and this is what really alarmed me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear people say, oh, we should do what South Korea did. We should just, you know, test, 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 test. And we don't have enough good tests. We haven't tested enough of that. We just did what they did and test this. You know, they've managed to get this thing to, to go, the, make the curve go down. Okay. So here's what actually happened. Somebody went to China, a South Korean, came back. They happened to be a member of one of these big, you know, messianic megachurches, and they got infected with the coronavirus. They gave it to a thousand people hmm. in this church, this megachurch. Those people went out into South Korea, and they started spreading it. Do you know how the South Korean government tested their way and stopped this? They... They sequestered, they, they detained and sequestered all the people connected with that church and everybody that they had ever had contact with. And they tested and retested, and they just basically locked it down. And we're talking about tens of thousands of people at this point. So this is the way that South Korea dealt with this. Mm -hmm. But there's a postscript to this now. So these, this church and is being reviled by the media in South Korea, I'm being told. And the government is prosecuting them. Okay, so, so what I want to say here is probably not going to make me super popular, but here's the deal. You know, we're not people, Catholics have never been people who are we don't have you know who live in some sort of dream world we mm -hmm. we are people who have our feet on the ground in fact we're the center of civilization the one that sprung science and engineering and all that other stuff right. so so i just want to you know say that we have a a real issue here if we've got all kinds of people who, who no longer believe that that we can't we can't deal with science. And, and, you know, as far as the bishops are concerned, I want to say a shout out to Phil Lawler for his most recent piece. I interviewed Phil once. Um, he said, you know, um, there, you know, the, he joined the chorus of voices about the bishops, but he basically said, well, what can bishops do with what they're not doing? All right. He can make it clear that the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice will continue each day, even if lay people cannot attend. Well, how, why is it that people don't know this anymore, that our priests do that? Of course priests do that every single day. But, you know, the bishop probably should tell people. Mm -hmm. He can tell the faithful that they are released from their obligation to attend Mass on Sunday. In many dioceses, the faithful have not been told that they are released from that obligation, only that they are barred from fulfilling it. Hmm. That would seem like 
you know, hello, that, you know, if you're a bishop, you should say something like that. You can make provision for sacramental confessions. You know, as Father Heilman has demonstrated to us out in fields or parking lots, as circumstances re require, and he can inform pastors that they have the authority to give general absolution during a time of crisis. He can encourage Eucharistic processions, benedictions, other forms of public prayer. They can be arranged at a safe social distance. Um, they can, he can go out into the streets himself. Um, Bishop Strickland um, in Texas did this, bring the blessed sacrament to a, a busy intersection. Bottom line, he can work to reassure the faithful that he is doing everything possible to make the sacraments available to the lady whenever and wherever it's possible. Okay, so we have to ask a question. Why has this not been done? Why has why is this just not standard operating procedure? Like why, you know, why does this like like it, it seems like, you know, the in many cases, the bishop said, right, well, I'll be at my, my condo in Florida. So, you know, like we're turning up the lights here and, uh, we, you know, we'll just, we'll see you. I mean, that's the impression that people have, whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. And I know we have more than 200 dioceses in this country and each one is a different situation. But, you know, like this is something that people should be told. Yeah. But overall, again, this is just, you know, what you just said, Doug, before, it's true. It's, it's a, an issue. People have lack of trust. Right. Right. Yeah. I see the lack of trust. And I also see so many out there who they'll read this article or that article from the CDC or from who world health organization or, or this group or that group. And they'll, they'll create an entire theory or opinion based on one or two articles rather than, you know, I mean, the videos that I've seen that are coming out of, um, you know, uh, Italy or out of Spain, uh, as you described the pictures, I've seen some of those videos of people just lined up in the waiting rooms. They're on gurneys in the waiting rooms. They're, they're, they're overwhelmed. Uh, there's a picture of the Italian prime minister out there in, uh, in, in tears, I, I believe. Maybe you saw this just recently, about an hour before we recorded this. And we're recording this. Uh, we released it on Wednesday, but we're recording it on Monday. We have to say this because by the time this gets out, yeah. eight hours from now, who knows what could be going on exactly. in 48 hours. Exactly. But, it, but the prime minister actually said, we've done everything we could and we're still, we've lost control, he says, of the situation. We can only turn to the sky, which you would have loved to hear him say, turn to God, but that's what he's saying. But, but, but these situations, then you, you take that and you bring that over here to the United States. And I know there are priests out there, good hearted people, people that I know, and, and you know, God bless you. I know some of you personally who are still saying, look, this is not, not really that much different than the flu. Um, Beverly, what's your opinion on that particular statement there, that this is not that much different than the flu, and there are, without saying it, there are people who are really kind of saying there are acceptable losses when it comes to situations like this, and we know some people are going to get really sick, and we know some people are going to die, um, and yet, even though they're saying that some of the CAT scans are showing young people, even with scarred lungs that they're going to have forever now. I mean, I, I don't say I have the answers on this. The whole thing's pretty overwhelming. But Beverly, what do you say based on your contacts and your own estimation on this when people compare this to just something like a serious flu? OK, so I want to there's a lot of things you brought up here. Doc. So so um, first of all. The, nece the necessity for good information. Part of the problem here is that the information itself is evolving in terms of what people understand. So this whole thing about testing, testing, testing that you keep hear hearing people talk about, well, you know, it was pretty clear from the presidential um, conferences that the, the tests themselves had a 40% neg false negative, okay, that were out there. So those tests that they were using up until very recently were themselves not very reliable. They were in effect turning people out with the flu that had this thing and that you know were going out and infecting. So that's one thing. Another thing, another example of false information is um, you know how contagious is this thing? All right, I've heard estimates anywhere from the average person can infect 2.6 people to the average person can infect 27 people. They have no concept. They just know it's incredibly contagious. So what do I mean? Well, um, 
in England, in Cheltenham, they had a, a gigantic event two weeks ago. People said, you know, don't do it. Don't have 250,000 people in one place. They did it anyway. Now, tons of people have, are now being diagnosed with this thing, okay? 250,000 people in one place. Same thing with Florida, with, um, you know, uh, spring break in Florida, another example. In Madrid, you know, these women's marches with these ridiculous nonsense going on is, is now a very big deal. You know, it, it's become fashionable. The, so there was like something like 100,000 people at a march in Madrid. All these people are now coming down with this stuff. So, so the, you know, I have to conclude that first of all, what we need is, of course, you know, somebody needs to tell the story of Typhoid Mary, okay? Typhoid Mary, and, and also to recall what happened in the Spanish influenza. It doesn't matter what you call something. You could call it the flu. You could call it anything you want to, but it's, it is highly contagious. It is deadly. Fal Another piece of false information, it doesn't affect young people. Well, gee, the Italians were trying to tell people, of course, you know, through the internet, because the, the, uh, the, the media was useless on this, that, that no, look at this person here, they're 25. Oh, I've got, I just posted a, um, uh, a video of a, a 40 year old veterinarian lady in, um, in Avellino in the south of Italy, um, who's, you know, hooked up to one of these things. And she's trying to tell people, no, it's not, you know, even in Italy, there are still people laboring under the misconception that it doesn't affect young people. So it's a, you know, yes, will it kill older people? Yes, will it kill people with immune um, disorders and so forth more? Yeah, but it will also seriously hurt young people. So is this the flu? No, it has morbidity levels anywhere from, I've seen figures, but 10 to 40 times what the flu has, and it is far more contagious than the flu. Mm. So we have bad information. And then this notion that you just talked about, um, about as far as the UK, uh, as far as the, um, the whole issue of, um, of what's acceptable losses. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> we have under a million ICU beds in this country. We have 350 million people in this country, okay? If only 100 million of them become infected, less than a third. And, and we are operating on what the number of people who need ICU is, is hovering around 8% in Italy. That's 8 million people who are gonna need those 1 million beds. That's the whole concept behind this flattening the curve thing. Right, right. And then there's another issue, and that is the whole issue of the healthcare people. I mean, my husband is a retired army medical guy. And, and you know, so I've lived with, like, you know, this sort of consciousness throughout our marriage. I mean, we've got, you know, healthcare people are, are, not, are not, you know, a... a, a an un, you know, what do you, what am I calling it? A, a resource that's not, that's, that's, that's eternal. Yeah. Unlimited you know? resource. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we're healthcare people are human beings and they're going to get sick. Right. And where's, where's the backup going to come from? Well, yeah, I, mean, I got you know, a friend. Go I ahead. Just would, I just want to say real quick before father, you jump in here is and on that point too. Um, any of the videos that anybody is showing of, of, the, the daily duty of an intensive care nurse or, or uh, uh, an emergency room doctor. I mean, they're working 10, 12 hour shifts. They're working 15 hour shifts longer. Um, they're overwhelmed by this. Many of them are saying, and this is not just from Italy. It's even a couple that have come out of uh, New York. Um, they're overwhelmed by this and they're very concerned because of the projection and because of of the increase of all of this. I, I just can't for the life of me think about why we're not thinking about those people being even emotionally, psychologically, just so beat down by the concern of this. I mean, Beverly, you probably saw maybe moments with your husband then over the years where, I mean, they're living with this life and death and the gravity of the concern that they're going to pick this up and many are getting sick 
and they don't want to carry this to their loved ones. I mean, this is this is a very difficult thing for our medical professionals alone that we the frontline defenders when it comes to the hospitals. One of one of my best friends is a uh, is in the medical uh, arena, right? And his wife is immunocompromised, mm. so he was chosen as some that could stay home for a little while. But as he describes, in all likelihood, in a week or two, he's going to ask to be come to the hospital. Well, then what? Then he has to be uh, distanced from his wife and his children for as long as they feel all is clear. That could be months. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing they're dealing with right now. They, they can't go there and then bring it back to those that are weak or old or, or immunocompromised or anything like that. You know, this is a period of time I think that heroes are going to be rising up. And, and we're going to look back on this time for, you know, many, many, probably hundreds of years and see all the heroes that, that, that rose up and, and decided. And, you know, I've been, I've been encouraging Catholics to um, be that hero, right? You know, be, be that hero. you got a choice. You can, you can choose heroism or you can choose the fetal position, you know, but do it under the power of grace. And a lot of people apparently are listening to that because, I have a steady flow to my uh, rectory confessional for people coming to receive, you know, the, the absolution and, and uh, be, to be, you know, detoxed from all their sins and so ready to be filled with God's amazing grace. But uh, I think heroes are going to rise. Don't you, Be uh, Beverly? Well, they are. And, um, and, and I'm starting to see it myself. And, and I think it, it's going to come as a result of people realizing a few things. I mean, um, first of all, we can live without our conveniences. Right. Okay? So, um, I mean, I cook every night anyway, so to me, it's no big deal. But, hey, you know, family time around the table, that's a really good thing. And, right. um, you know, there's, so there's, there's, there's upside to what's happening to us that I think will, will change people's lives. I also want to say one thing before I forget about this acceptable casualties thing, all right? So um, the, the UK was going to do this, according to my UK contacts. As of 10 days ago, the policy that they were going to use was basically they were looking at it like this. Well, our economy is based primarily on communication and transportation. London is the hub of not just Europe in terms of business, but also Africa, the Middle East, and big chunks of Asia. So from their point of view, stopping the flights coming in was not something that they were going to do. Wow. So their point of view was, okay, so let's just go ahead with this thing and we'll just let it wash through the UK. We'll put everybody, we'll tell everybody who's over 70 to you know, basically bar themselves in their homes. And we'll let the flu hit and we'll keep the, you know, we'll keep the, the old folks' homes secure and we'll you know we'll get herd immunity this was the whole concept right yeah the uk's doctors rose up against this and said and and then not to mention doctors from around the world like absolutely not mm. this is not acceptable this is this is not acceptable to do this so i think that what we're seeing is a general consensus emerging among authorities about how it is that we should deal with this thing. And I think it's going to go, this is, you know, this is just me, but I think it's going to go something like this. Basically lockdown. I mean, America is hard to compare to other places because we're not a country. We're a continent. All right. This is a big, big, big place. And if you don't believe me, fly over America and look out of the window at night. You can fly <laughs> for an hour and a half and not see anything. No kidding. So yeah. this is a big place. So so certain places are hot spots, right? Seattle, my own native New York. Um, it, there's there's a couple of other. New Orleans is, is not great. Chicago. So So I think that the strategy that they're looking at, or one of the strategies, is to isolate those hotspots by locking everything down as much as they possibly can getting to the people and testing the people 
who come down with this, but testing them in those drive-through facilities, which they're starting to set up, so that they keep the people out of the clinics and the hospitals so they can't infect other people if they have it. And they can't pick up the infection if they don't, right? So get a lot of people tested, get them through the system, and then find out who their contacts were, get those people tested, and get them isolated. And do it on a place-by-place -place basis. I think that's the strategy that they're looking at. Mm. So that's that's just my see the pants, you know, feeling. Uh, again, this thing is is moving so fast. It's so fluid. The other thing, you know, I that I, I didn't know. So you have you noticed that the the town name Bergamo keeps coming yeah. up in right. in, in Italy? Italy, right? So Bergamo is an international airport. I've flown in and out of there dozens of times. And it's a it's a beautiful old medieval town that has an airport right, like a big, huge airport right there. So it's a town that just washes through people from all over the, all the time. Mm. So you can see the sort of Petri dish conditions under which this thing can proliferate, right? right? Maybe not where you are, Father, because you're, you're kind of the opposite of Bergamo. So, but the point is, you, we want to identify the Bergamos, and we want to put our resources against those and, and nail this thing down. Yeah. Now, when when your your contacts that you have, Beverly, which I I, I find is one of the most helpful sources in times like this, because it, it is so hard to trust any of the major news networks. Um, and when someone sends a message or there's someone who's working at a hospital in a town, they're right there, their boots on the ground, so to speak, right. right in the thick of it. What are they telling you even like, do you have any contacts over in China, Singapore? China's been been saying they've got no new cases for a couple of days. And then they started saying, well, we've got a few, but they're coming from people who are coming into China. But we've really kind of solved the problem here in China. Now, they're a communist government. So I, my first response is I, I don't trust it. But then I've seen some videos of some uh, independent news outfits who are who are who are saying that the residents there are leaking information out, saying that they don't have this under control, that there are more cases, and that even in Beijing they're talking about um, and Hong Kong that they're talking about a second wave that may be coming. Do you know anything to uh, any contacts in in these areas, these regions that, that could uh, verify any of this? I don't have anybody in China, but I do have like I said, good sources in Singapore. Um, and, you know, they have taught me a lot. And the first thing they've taught me is that the Chinese lie. Mm. And the second thing they, they, they have told me is that, and when I say the Chinese, I am referring to the government of China. Right. Um, that the government of China not just lies, but it has a, a completely... Um, um, a moral approach to management. Essentially, what it what it's all about is what's going to work. If it's you know if it's going to guess what we want, we do it. There just is not the regard for life. So people are terrified in China. The fact that there's any information being leaked out at all, um, in which people are, are saying, I've had I just had something from somebody yesterday, who who through Singapore, who said, well, they knew somebody in China and any numbers you're getting from China, just add two zeros to the end of it. Hmm. And that will tell you what's really going on. Wow. Um, there's, you know, an, wanna... there's another news outlet reporting that in the last month, 23 million Chinese have dropped off of um, cell phone networks. Wow. Oh, really? Yeah. So wow. there's a whole lot like, so what they're going to say and what we're going, you know, it's, it's, I don't believe them. I mean, I've heard, no. I've heard enough from my Singaporean contacts that I would be very, very doubtful about anything they say. Sure. You know, before we conclude too, I want to get back to uh, the church. Um, you know, we had that first weekend this past weekend where all the churches were 
Father, um, I'm sorry. Can I, I need to interrupt you just so the audience doesn't misunderstand you. When, when, when Father Heilman says, I need to get back to the church, let's make sure we understand what he means by that. <laughs> Father didn't leave the church. The topic of the church. <laughs> the topic that we, <laughs> of the church. I, I just want to make sure everybody yeah. understands. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. <laughs> so anyway, uh, getting back to the topic of the church, um, <laughs> You know, I, I, I was uh, I was reflecting this weekend when I when I was sitting there preaching to an empty church, but we had live stream, and uh, you know it's it's different, <laughs> it's quite a bit different. But you know, uh, I, I was reflecting about what it's going to be like when we get the green light and we all get to get back together again in that church. I mean, imagine that day. Imagine that day. And, and so there's that. And, and I, I see a longing. I'm seeing all these pictures on the internet of these families building like little altars yeah. before the TV screen. I mean, it's so cool. Um, but there's just a longing. I mean, just a longing uh, for our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And I also want to give a shout out to, I know that, yes, uh, like in a lot of organizations, you're going to have some crooked people in there. But I, and I'm not saying this just to schmooze our own bishops here, but Doug. But you and I are blessed. You know, right. Doug works for Bishop, Bishop Strickland, um, and he's just incredible. And I work for Bishop Hying, and he's unbelievable. And was, so we're really blessed. I know, I know that I know that it was wrenching for them yeah. to pull the trigger and say you have to be distanced from our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, I know that, and I know that their motive was to save grandma, you know, to, for people to pass that on. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, there was probably a mixture of all the legal stuff and all that. And I also know, too, that a lot of priests um, are looking for any, any way possible, but within the confines of obedience to their bishop. You know, we're just appendages of our bishop. You know, when we're out in these parish, parishes, it's, you know, if you're not obeying your bishop as a priest, you're missing priesthood completely. Uh, and, you know, we have great, great bishops. And so, you know, within the parameters of what my bishop has laid out as directives, we're doing our best out here. We really are. And, and I, I just, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm seeing so many uh, amazing ideas. I'm stealing a lot of them from the priests around the nation. Uh, in ways in which they're 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 able to uh, serve their people again within the parameters of the directives of our bishop. So it, there's there's lots of good news out there and a great hope uh, for that wonderful day when we all, all return. But I think you know I've said this and uh, I said I I think I use the image the child runs out into busy traffic and the father calls out to that child and says get back here. And the child turns around, comes back, tearful, knows that they were wronged, begs forgiveness. The father throws the arms around the child and says, oh, I love you and I forgive you. You're grounded for two weeks. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because to understand the severity of what that child just did. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we're being in a period here where we have to understand the severity of a few things. And as long as we're on the mass, I'll just say, love the Nova Sordo, love the traditional Latin mass. Don't like all the innovations that came since the onset of the Nova Sordo. Mm. Uh, I, I, I don't like clown masses. <laughs> I don't like, uh, I'm not going to get into it, but you know what I mean. And I, I, and I wonder if Abba, Papa, Daddy, isn't saying, you know, why don't you just take a time out and think about stuff for a while? What do you think? Well, you just asked me a question that is definitely above my pay grades. <laughs> I don't but, know about that. But, You're a holy woman, Beverly. Yeah, no. <laughs> but but um, I, I would think that, you know, it really is sort of remarkable what, that we have seen um, so much um, in the church in terms of corruption, that um, that this particular virus would come along the way it is, um, would certainly, I think, make people 
um, start to think about their own mortality. Um, and I really also um, pray that what it does is bring people, um, you know, more down to earth as to, you know, what the, what, what the, how valuable the faith is, how important the faith is. Yeah. And, um, you know, all those years living in Europe, I got to, to see the, um, how the faith saved our ancestors. Um, and, and this is not taught anywhere in Europe anymore. Um, and, and we're the, we're the, you know, how many generations, um, first and second generation, um, on, on both sides, many of us are third, fourth, fifth generations, and we don't know the story why our parents left. Well, our parents left, our, our ancestors left um, in large measure because those countries where they were, were under intense stress, economic persecution of the church, persecution of Catholics. Um, a lot of us don't even know the real story. And when you go back to those countries today, they don't really know the real story anymore about what happened. You have to dig it up. So I guess what I'm saying is the, the, the faith is a precious pearl. It is, it is the organizing principle of our civilization. Right. And it is, um, you know, and, and it has the remarkable property of being able to be incredibly corrupted and then just as quickly claimed. Yeah. So um, I guess that's what I would leave you with. Yeah. Well, you know, on, on this subject, Father, I know my wife and I, we, uh, uh, this last Sunday, you know, celebrated mass in the living room, you know, yeah. watch it on TV. And, you know, at the, at the, at the moment of communion, you know, uh, we both had tears in our eyes. And yeah. I know that we're not the only ones. There are a lot out there. I mean, I, there's a side of me that in a, I mean, this in all due respect, Father, I envy the priest right now because you get to receive Jesus every day, yeah. you know, in these times. I think about everyone when I'm consuming our Lord. I'm just like, oh, yeah. you know, I know what you're feeling. I mean, I, I understand what you're feeling. But it's, it's one of those moments where, you know, for those of us who are trying to be faithful Catholics, and I speak to all the faithful Catholics out there, those who are struggling and trying, and we're weeping a little bit, whether it's literally or just internally, interiorly. I say weep. We have a lot of reason to weep. We, we, yeah. um, we've slaughtered millions of babies in this country and other countries since 1973. Roe v. Wade, uh, 60, 70 million, whatever the numbers are that, that we know are reported. And there's many more that aren't. We've seen human trafficking grow. We've seen you know pornography consume marriages and families and hearts and souls. We've seen all of the struggles, the social issues, all the moral relativism that has really, really hit us hard. And a lot of people have made the choice to give into it. Yeah. We have seen so many people choose not to go to mass in America alone, 19, late 1950s. It was about 80% of Catholics went faithfully. Now it's about 20. And the recent report, Father, you and I have talked about this on the show of yeah. You know, of, of roughly 30% of Catholics who actually believe Jesus is present in the Eucharist. We have all these things going on. We've seen statues of our Blessed Mother and images of Mary and Jesus, miraculous images and statues that are weeping. So now we all get a chance to weep. And I yeah. say, let's weep for the right reasons. I mean, this coronavirus right. thing may very well be being allowed by God, at the very least, to wake us up a little bit. Right. You know, God can use these things. If he can use the cross to bring about the salvation of the world, he can use a, an infectious disease that's, that's really impacting the whole world economically and, and through health and so forth and families. I mean, the images of, of uh, recently an image of a man serenading his, his wife who has Alzheimer's in a nursing home through the window because he's not right. allowed to go into the building. We see yeah. these and it wakes us up to something and it's stripping away our false gods and giving us an opportunity to actually really look at what's important. And maybe God is saying, like you said, father, Hey, out of the street, I love you so much. I've got to discipline you now. Right. I've got to allow this to become a discipline. And I know there are people out there who say, no, this is not an act of God. No, this is not a chastisement. And my answer to that is you don't know that. 
Yeah, we, we don't, don't know, know the mind of God, but what we do know is that the Blessed Mother has made clear in in and we can we can speak to the church approved apparitions where she has made clear over and over again just in the last hundred years that this country, this world, God is not happy with our ingratitude. That's what the angel of peace said in 1916 to the children of Fatima. He's very angry over man's ingratitude. In Akita in 73. Sister Agnes was told by our Blessed Mother that God is preparing a great chastisement for the world because the world needs to know his anger and his wrath because of our sin. I mean, we have all these reasons to believe that God might be kind of kind of giving us a hint, mm -hmm. really. And by taking the Mass in, in, this, in this situation and, and, and where we cannot come to him so freely anymore, hopefully right. we do weep inside enough to more deeply appreciate I like what you said, Father, in the post that you put out a, a couple of days ago about, I, I, you said, I look forward to the day when we're all together in the Mass again. Yeah. I, I hope I don't ball for the entire thing. I know, I, I know. Mean, you're I, right. I, I will, I will. We're, we're going to appreciate it much more differently yeah. the day we're all allowed to go back to Mass without yeah. this fear looming over us. Yeah. Beverly, you want to, we're going to, uh, we're at the tail end here. You Can you close us out with some thoughts you might have? Well, um, at the risk of being ridiculously prosaic, um, people need to stay home, yep. wash their hands, disinfect yep. everything that comes in the house. Yes. Um, I've just published, and I thought, very good guidelines for those of us who do fly, because you have to, you know, fly with a mask and with gloves disinfect everything around you on the plane. And when you get off the plane, take your go into the bathroom, take your clothes off and put fresh clothes on and launder those clothes. And when you get home, wash. Yeah. I mean, shower and all that. I mean, this is, as I said, this is prosaic, but this is very important. Yep. Because again, the state of information that we have right now is not, is not, I mean, I've heard people say, oh, no problem. You know, if you if you touch a surface three hours, you know, later, the, you know, the virus is dead or the virus dies in heat. Mm -hmm. Both of those things are wrong. OK, so this is a very dangerous time that we're in because we right. don't understand the nature of this thing. And the best thing we can do to protect ourselves and our families and our loved ones is to be very vigilant. Thank you, Be Beverly. Um, Thanks, Beverly. And it, yeah, this has been great. And, uh, you know, I just want to leave, though, just giving people um, a sense of hope Amen. that that this is a time for us. I, I, I talked about this before to look at our vertical thirst. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're so we've been stuck on our horizontal thirst, you know, golfing and fishing and and, you know, playing, you know, going to the ball game and all this stuff, which are not bad. They're wonderful. Recreate. That's beautiful. But when they become the whole of our lives, right? And now those horizontal thirsts are gone, at least temporarily. And what a great time to, to work on that vertical thirst, to work on that, on that uh, relationship with God. And so uh, let's, let's all stick together. Let's pray for each other. And uh, this will be over. This will be over. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Saint Joseph, foster father of Jesus, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thanks, Beverly. This was great. Thanks, God bless you. Good to have you on the show. Thanks, guys.